This morning I'd like to direct your attention to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis 45, first book of the Bible. And I'll read for you the first, uh, I believe it's 13 verses of the, no, 15 verses, verses 1 through 15. Genesis 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you, preserve for you a remnant on earth to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and all your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, and of all that you have seen. Hurry, and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Let's pray. Father, as we look once more to your word and see the wonders and mysteries that it unfolds, we pray for the help of your spirit, that we would see the truths of your word, understand them in their clarity and their power. And may we be moved to faith and trust in you. May we rest in your provision of grace to us in Jesus Christ. And may we go from here filled with joy and peace of heart, knowing that we are in your hands. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christopher Nolan has produced another blockbuster in the movie theaters. This one is called Dunkirk, a war movie based on the Second World War and the... uh, uh, miraculous escape of British soldiers and uh, French as well from the beaches of Dunkirk. Uh, The historical setting is the Second World War, Germany coming through, they uh, trapped these soldiers there on the beach and they were doing all they could to get out of there and a great flotilla of boats of private people with their yachts and their fishing boats came from England across the channel to Dunkirk and there they uh, individually kept, got all these soldiers on board their ships and crossed the sea. Many soldiers lost their life in the course of the battle, but many too were rescued and saved. It's a, 
a gripping movie and a, a, a movie that immerses you into the warfare itself. You almost feel the bullets flying all around you. You uh, watch this amazing cinematography as these fighter planes, these Spitfires, uh, fight against a German Luftwaffe uh, up in the sky, and you see them go down and hit the water. It's an amazing film. Some, many movie critics hail it as the greatest war movie ever. And it indeed is uh, attracting great audiences throughout the nation and around the world. As I watched the movie, I was trying to figure out what was happening. There is very little description in the course of the film. No great historical context given to you. You are just simply put there in the midst of a band of soldiers who narrowly escape death. One just escapes uh, among the British and makes his way to the beach. The German soldiers on the whole in the German army remains faceless, a force, a malevolent force at work to destroy the British soldiers. There's no interpretation of the events, no plan given to what's happening. There's no uh, uh, real uh, uh, scene in Parliament or in, in the, uh, the seats of power where generals are arguing over which direction they should take the, the military. And so it is a, a, a scene which is without explanation. And the soldiers very much suffer uh, uh, in, in very random acts of violence. One film critic notes that Christopher Nolan is a, a materialist, a mechanist. He views the world in view of uh, mere uh, uh, forces and, and uh, mechanical realities. And that infuses his uh, films. And many of his films have characters that uh, struggle to find truths, tr struggle to find meaning, but never actually arrive at any meaning. As I it's a wonderful film in that sense. But in, in my view, it is a nihilistic film, a film that interprets the experiences of life in such a way that there is no explanation. There's no, there's no grand plan to everything. Things happen randomly, and we just simply suffer and die. It was rather ironic in the film that there were glimpses of Churchill's heroic speech in Parliament that uh, we will fight them in the land, we will fight them on the sea, and, and so forth. And here are these British soldiers not fighting on, on the land. They're being slaughtered. What an ironic picture, soldiers out on the boats just being shot up and destroyed. Not much of a fight there. The irony continues, and uh, one of the boys uh, of England get on a, a private yacht and they go across the channel. They find a sailor is adrift and they rescue him. And accidentally, the boy is knocked down in a struggle, in a scuffle. He hits his head and eventually dies. He returns home and is labeled a hero. But what did he do other than board the ship? It's meaningless. It's a nihilistic film. No meaning to history, no values. Indeed, I would say it's an argument against war. There's no sense to it. What a different atmosphere we come to when we come to the scriptures, to the story of Joseph in particular, a story that does not look on history as a, a mindless, meaningless concatenation of events, a mechanical unrolling of forces and uh, history in such a way that we are caught up in the maelstrom of history and we suffer and die and, and that's it. Rather, within uh, the framework of the scriptures, there is a God who is our creator, who has formed a plan and has, is working out his plan in the course of history. That plan is sovereign to him it is kept in eternity past and reserved. It's full, complete. It's one. It's mysterious to us on this side of creation. We don't understand all the time what God is doing, but we see the unfolding of that grand plan through the course of history and time. And so history becomes meaningful, not meaningless. History has significance. There's a point to everything. There is a goal. And that becomes very apparent in the story here 
with Joseph. There are multiple levels, multiple layers of divine providence, of divine planning that comes into view here. And as we unravel these things, as we explore them and open them up, we'll see the wonders of God's sovereign plan and how the sovereign plan is not a threat as the, a, mechanic, a mechanistic worldview is, a fatalistic, nihilistic worldview is, where we are just cogs in a machine and we are ground down until we suffer and die. But rather, we have an all-wise creator who has ordered all things certain and sure for the good of his people and for his own glory and praise. And so my hope is that as we consider this morning the master plan that God has for all of history and time, that we'll come away with the sense that we can be at peace with what God is doing and find our place in that great plan that God has made for us himself. As we step into this story, as we immerse ourselves in the story itself, we find ourselves in Egypt, and here Joseph is uh, a mature man. He's been in Egypt for many years now, and he has gone through many experiences to rise to the point of being the second only to Pharaoh, ruling over Egypt. You remember the story of how his brothers were envious of Joseph's um, uh, favor before their father, uh, Jacob. Jacob lavished Joseph with uh, presents and, and with gifts, and, and it was very obvious that he was his father's favorite. And the brothers were envious of him, and they found an opportunity when Joseph was vulnerable, away from the father, away from the family, and they eventually sold him into slavery to Egypt. And so they were rid of this one. Joseph goes to Egypt and he becomes a slave in the house of a, a, an official there in Egypt. That's bad, but then things get worse. He's falsely accused by uh, the slave owner's wife, and he finds himself next in prison. So he goes from slavery to imprisonment. And there in prison, you recall, God has given him uh, some companions, a, a butler and a baker from Pharaoh's own court. And they have dreams. Well, dreams are something that Joseph was familiar with. When he was a boy, he had dreams in his father's house. And he had these marvelous dreams where he would be exalted in front of his brethren. And they would bow down to him. Even his parents would bow down to him. And that was part of what made his brothers and even his parents upset with Joseph. You can imagine the youngest one having dreams like that. And so... Now Joseph is in prison in Egypt, and you gotta think, what's going on in his mind? What does he think about the plan of God for his life? How is it that these dreams are going to be fulfilled in his life? It's apparent that he remained a faithful servant of the Lord, even under those circumstances. And he interprets the dreams of the butler and the baker, the dreams come true, and yet, when the butler returns into the service of Pharaoh, he completely forgets about Joseph for a period of time. But God is not finished with Joseph. God has a purpose for him. And he, uh, Pharaoh begins having dreams, and the butler is reminded of Joseph. Joseph comes in, interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and then he's placed as the head over Egypt. What we see is the sovereign plan of God at work in Joseph's life, bringing him to this point. Many steps along the way from the dreams that God gave to Joseph as a child uh, and the outworking of that through the various stages of his life, his betrayal by his brethren, his enslavement in Egypt, uh, his imprisonment, and finally being turned over to Pharaoh and become the ruler over all. All of this worked out by the sovereign plan of God. But there are layers to the plan. It goes even deeper than that. Years ago, God made a covenant with Abraham. And in this covenant, he told Abraham that his descendants would one day go to a nation where they would be enslaved for 400 years. And God would bring them up out of there. And so the life of Joseph, his simple little dreams, his uh, betrayal by his brethren, his sufferings in Egypt were all part of the grander plan of God bringing his people down into Egypt. Why? Because God would bring a famine across the land. 
And they would suffer if they didn't go down into Egypt and there there would be bread for them. And so God works out this plan for the children of Abraham. Years later, through the life of Joseph, a marvelous plan. And when the brethren, Joseph's brothers appear before him in Egypt and it's revealed to them that this one whom they betrayed, whom they sold to Egypt and wanted him dead, some of them wanted to murder him outright, when they finally realize that they're standing before this Joseph, they got to think, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm in trouble. This one that I betrayed is now the ruler over all of Egypt and he has me right here in front of him. And yet Joseph does not look on them and their evil, their sin, but he looks at the grand plan of God and the purposes of God. This was in fulfillment of God's very plan. And so Joseph, because of those early dreams, was able to reinterpret the experiences of his life and understand them in the light of God's providence. And so when he deals with his brethren who have offended him, who have done great evil against him, he could look at that all in the context of God's greater plan. And he was ready to forgive, eager to forgive. Because he understood that God had this all under control. In fact, Joseph says in verses 5 and 7 that God planned this for good, to save many lives, indeed to spare a remnant of, of your family here in Egypt so that many would be able to live. Joseph saw that there was a good purpose to all this in God's mind. And then we return to this theme in the 50th chapter of Genesis where Joseph is once more before his brethren and now their father Jacob has died and so the protective umbrella of their father is gone and now they feel exposed once again to Joseph and Joseph says you meant this for evil but God meant it for good and so Joseph had an insight into the plan of God and the outworking of that plan in his life in the life of all those who are around him. When we look at God's sovereign plan, there are a number of things that we can uh, highlight here. And the first is that this plan of God is comprehensive in nature. It goes beyond merely the, the small details of Joseph's life to extend to the movements of peoples and nations and indeed uh, the effects on the environment as well. The whole earth is under the hands of the Lord. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he ordains all that should take place. You might remember the words of Isaiah the prophet that we read earlier from the 46th chapter where uh, he talks about uh, the sovereignty of God. Who shows us more of the majesty and the glory of God than Isaiah? When we begin his prophecy, you have that wonderful image of him in the sixth chapter, standing before God, the cherub and the seraphim, hiding their face before the glory of God and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with your glory. And here in the 46th chapter, Isaiah uh, proclaims the word of the Lord, I am the Lord. I created the heavens and the earth. My will, my purpose will be done, declaring the end from the beginning and the things that must take place from eternity. God has ordained the course of human history. All things come under the scope of his grand plan. The Apostle Paul echoes that in his own uh, way in the first chapter of Ephesians that we read in the 11th verse where he piles up one uh, synonym after the other, talking about the will of God and the purpose of God, his plan, his predestined purpose, that all things should be done in accord with his will everything being brought together in Christ as the head over all. And so all of human history and all of its movements is arranged and ordered by God. Paul says in Acts 17 in his argument with the, the philosophers that God is the one who's ordained the, the places where the nations should live. He sets their boundaries. He raises up one nation and uh, uh, turns down another. God is sovereign not only in the grand setting of the universe, the setting of the stars and the course of the planets, even the, the eclipse of the sun from time to time, but he is sovereign 
in the movement of nations. He arranges all that should take place. It is a comprehensive plan that includes all the great things of life, but it goes down to the nitty-gritty details. There's not one moment of life that escapes the purpose of God. Joseph's dreams, the animosity of his brethren, his father's favoritism towards him, his enslavement in Egypt, all these little details are foreordained by God. They are part of his plan. Indeed, even what appears to be a random act of chance to us, Proverbs says in 16.33, the casting of the lot is from the Lord. All of its decisions are made by the Lord. And so even things which seem to be random are set under the purpose, sovereign purpose of God. Nothing is outside of his care and control. He has a comprehensive plan. Indeed, this plan is marvelous to behold. When we consider how broad and deep it is, we perceive that it is a plan that is established in eternity because only a plan in eternity can be comprehensive of all of human history. The plan must be before the heavens and the earth were created. And so it is we see in scripture that God plans all things out from eternity past. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 that before the, the creation of the earth, he chose us in Christ. There was his plan already at the very start. A comprehensive plan is only comprehensive if the one who makes it is outside of history, making that plan, and God makes that plan in eternity past. It is an eternal plan. It is one plan. For us, we see the outworking that plan in history and time but because it's an eternal plan before God, he sees everything all at once. There's no mystery to God. There's no unfolding of secret purposes. It's all apparent to him. He sees it all in one moment. One glorious plan in eternity past. What a comprehensive plan God has for us. As it is a comprehensive plan, it is also a sovereign plan. It is the execution of the plan of the one who describes himself as the Lord God. Isaiah, in that 46th chapter, talks about the gods of Bel and Nebo, the gods of, uh, the, I believe it's, uh, of the Babylonians, who must be lifted up and carried about. And when people get too heavy, when it gets too heavy for the people, they've got to put them down for a while because these gods can't do anything for themselves. And later on in the chapter, he says that they have to manufacture these gods and set them up in their place, and they can't move from there. They can't answer anything. What use are these gods, the Lord says. I am the Lord. I created the heavens and the earth. I am the one that lifts you up. I carry you. It's not you carrying me around in this little statue. I am lifting you up and carrying you. God is sovereign. He is the king. And so the effecting of his plan is a powerful outworking of his will that cannot be stopped. His will is immutable, unchangeable. It cannot be varied. We cannot negotiate with God. We cannot argue with him. His plan is set and he is the king. He will carry it out in all of its particular details. That must be the case. Some who hold to Arminian views or Pelagian views reject this notion and say that man is free. Man uh, it must be free in order to be held accountable for his actions, and so he can make his choice one way or the other. And if God does have any sort of election, if there is some sort of foreknowledge of God, it's only in the sense that God sees into the future and sees what man will do. And then he chooses him consequently in view of his view of what man will do. Well, that really doesn't escape the problem. If God can see into the future and see what man will do, he can know what will take place only because that future is set in some form or fashion. How can he know what my choice will be unless somehow that choice is already fixed? Who fixes it? And what is more, how can God really know what choice I will make? If I am free, 
a free actor and can choose A or B or even C, God can't know, and so all the future remains a mystery for God himself. He doesn't really know. He knows all different kinds of possibilities, but does he really know what will take place? He can't if you are truly a free actor. Well, then are we robots under the sovereign plan of God and unable to do whatever we want? No, scripture is very clear. We are accountable to God for our actions. We are responsible for that which we do. Our actions are the, the expression of our own nature and we do what we want to do. Uh, that, that's immediately apparent in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Everything that God foreordained and planned took place at the hands of wicked men, Peter says, Acts chapter 2. You have crucified Christ. At the hands of wicked men, you betrayed him to the Romans and you had him crucified. This was an evil thing. But it was accomplished by the sovereign plan of God, who works all things according to his will. You are accountable. You are sinners. You have done that which is evil, and you must repent of your sins but everything works out according to God's purpose. And so God allows the evil to take place, which is the expression of the human heart. But he so arranges all things that he accomplishes his will. If you want to get into theology, we talk about second causes. And God does not immediately do the things that we do. We do them ourselves. But he arranges all things in such a way that we do what we want to do. And yet at the same time, it is to his own glory and according to his plan. Now, as we sit here and look at that, we say, well, how can that be? God's fully sovereign. People are held accountable. They're responsible for their actions. How do I put this together? Well, I don't have a magical wand for you. <laughs> Scriptures are very clear that God is sovereign in control of all things, and we are held accountable for each and every action that we do. And we feel that we are free to do whatever we want to do. God doesn't force us against us our will to do something do what we want. What we say is that God teaches these things, and because God is the infinitely wise, all-knowing God, he understands how all these things work out. We are finite creatures. We only see so much. We cannot explore all these mysteries. We cannot explain all these things. We trust that God has all these things in mind. The mysteries that are very evident in the world around us are not things which are without explanation. They are within the sovereign mind of God who understands these things through and through. It's perfectly wise, perfectly good. And so we can leave them there. What a contrast to the mechanistic worldview of Christopher Nolan where there is no explanation. We're just cogs in the wheel ready for destruction. All of life, in the end, is covered in mystery. Do you understand the relationship of the soul and the body? Do you understand how love operates? There are all many mysteries to the world around us. We trust that God understands these things and works them out according to his will. And so, the will of God is sovereign, it's powerful, it's all wise, it is effective in accomplishing his will, and then finally I'll make this point, God's will is redemptive in its purpose. Joseph saw a good reason for what God was doing, and that sustained him in the miseries and sufferings of life. God had a good purpose in mind in all these things. He would bring about a greater good, a famine was coming, and God warned Joseph in advance. You've got seven years of plenty to prepare for the famine, and then when the famine hits, you've got to draw off of those seven years and live off of that. And God will save and spare many people. It was a good provision of God's grace. But it was more than about eating and pe keeping people alive. God had a redemptive purpose for the family of his elect, the children of Abraham, this remnant whom he would preserve. And it would be through Joseph's actions that these, this family would be spared. 
And it is through this family that the Christ would come and bring us redemption. Joseph himself and all of his experiences foreshadows the coming of Christ. We see Christ in Joseph. Jesus born of Joseph who has a dream, a vision of God's bringing a child into his life, a special child. Jesus betrayed by his brethren when uh, Judas Iscariot betrays him to the Jews and when the Jews themselves betray him to the Romans and turn him over to be crucified. Jesus imprisoned in the bonds of death for three days. And yet Jesus also by revelation, by the power of God, raised from the dead, raised to heaven above, seated upon God, on the throne at God's right hand, second over all, the heavens and the earth ruling over all things. Do we not see in Joseph a glimpse of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory? God has a redemptive plan in place, a purpose for all that goes on in the world, all for our good, as Paul says in Romans 8. All things, all things, the comprehensive plan of God works together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. There's a tremendous redemptive plan at work in history and time for the salvation of God's elect, known to God from eternity past, and they will enjoy forever and ever the delights of the fulfillment of that plan in the new heavens and the new earth. And at that day, we will look back at the course of history and I think we'll spend an eternity, in part, unfolding the details of that plan and all the mysteries of things that have taken place, from the obscurity of my birth at Memorial Hospital in Roxboro, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, till the very end of time, however time may be. There is a wonder and a mystery to God's plan. And we will spend an eternity exploring the mind of God and His sovereign will. And we'll see that God meant it for good and will rejoice. I urge you to see the sovereign plan of God as comprehensive and good and allow that sovereign plan to give you the comfort and peace that it alone can bring. Meditate on this. Have your mind filled with this so that when you face troubles in life, when you face hostility, you can look beyond the insults and beyond the, the offenses and all the kinds of troubles, the, the strife that you experience, and see the greater good. God has a purpose behind it all. It will end in your resurrection and your greater glory. And so be at peace. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Why? Because the Lord is near. He is at hand. He is the Lord of history and he's working all things out according to his will. And so therefore, commit all your cares, cast them all upon the Lord because he cares for you. We don't live in a mindless world with a reckless movement of chance. We have a loving God who cares for us. And when you can commit those things to the Lord, God, the Apostle Paul says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. When you have a sovereign Lord who ordains all that takes place, then your heart can be filled with peace. You can enjoy rest. Whatever life brings your way. You have this dream, this vision, that which God has given to you in Jesus Christ. And let that keep you till the very end of history and time. Well, we've taken just a moment to explore something of the wonders of God's sovereign plan. This is a master plan. It's a plan that should occupy our hearts and minds and thrill us to know that it's the plan of a heavenly Father who loves us and is accomplishing our redemption in the course of history and time. Derive the benefit that that plan brings to you. Don't be frightened by wars and troubles and all these kinds of things. But see that God is in control, bringing about the salvation of his people and his greater glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which you worked in the life of a young boy who had various dreams, mysterious dreams, 
uh, wonderful dreams of a future day of glory. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we have more than dreams, but we have your very word given to us through the apostles and prophets, as we have the fulfillment of that word in Christ revealed to us, as we have this on which we can be sure, we pray that you would fill our minds with hope and give us great peace, that we would rest in your provision for us, that we would trust you in good times and bad. And even in those days when the skies are darkened, the sun is taken away from us, may we trust in your providence, rest in your will, and know that your love always shines towards us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.